there are some doors that it's, they're easy to get into, but you shouldn't go through them. <laughs> right? There's some people that just don't have your best interests at heart. What is a producer's rep? It's like a sales agent. It's another name for a sales agent. So um, in the, it usually connotes being a domestic sales agent as opposed to an international sales agent. It's a little different in that as a producer rep, you are selling films to US distributors. And in doing so, there's, you don't really have to take over the film from the filmmaker. You can make the deal, you can negotiate on their behalf, and then they can deliver the film to the distributor and the distributor can pay them directly. It's a fairly easy transaction. Whereas on the international front, international sales agents really have to take over that process. So international sales agents are more like distributors in that you deliver them the film, and then they go to markets around the world, sell these distributors, and then in turn deliver the film to those distributors, collect that money, and then account to a, um, a producer. So in my case, I don't do it. I don't do that. I specialize in U.S. distributors, and um, as most producer reps do, and I'm just I'm like a I'm like a consultant slash sales agent for that purpose. What's the difference between a producer's rep and a distributor? So a producer rep is really trying to get the film maker the best deal possible in the United States with a with a traditional distributor. Um, distributors are, are taking on the film, putting it in theaters, putting it on video on demand, making Blu-rays, selling the rights to Netflix or HBO, and putting it on advertising video on demand later like Tubi or Pluto. So they, they're usually, most distributors are handling all rights that way. As a producer rep, I'm meeting the filmmaker usually about the time they've finished the film or about to get into a film festival or just got into a film festival and I'm going to help them get into the world of distribution and show the film to the distributors to see who would be the best possible partner for taking the film out. Why would a filmmaker hire a producer rep? Well, especially if you're a first-time filmmaker, um, most schools don't teach film distribution. And so there's just a huge learning gap. Um, uh, in terms of like what distribution is and what they do and, and usually I consider my part of my job is education in terms of teaching my clients what distributors do and which distributors do it better than who. Um, and part of my job is to know who's doing it legitimately and who's not doing it le legitimately and who takes an appropriate distribution fee for putting the film out into the world, who's kind of the, trying to rip them off. Um, and so it's to protect them as well. Um, so there's, there's really just the knowledge of distribution. That's one reason. Another is just protection. Um, uh, and in, in addition, some salesmanship. Um, I'm trying to get the best possible deal out there. And some filmmakers, you know, a filmmaker in, in, in theory could wear all those hats. And they got to learn the distribution landscape and learn who all the distributors are and learned how to negotiate these, the contracts and had a sales hat in addition to a creative hat. There are those types, right, that, that could do it all. Um, I'm here for the ones that don't, you know, and producer reps in general are there for the people who, who can't, you know, that need some help in that, in that area. Have you ever experienced that where someone says, you know, I went to AFM, I go on IMDb Pro and I see what similar films are, who they're with, and I just can't navigate this. Can you help me? Yeah, all the time because there's, um, there are a lot of different kinds of, People at AFM, like they're sales agents versus distributors. Sometimes they they do both. There's been an increasing trend of some international sales agents getting into U.S. distribution. Their contracts look a little bit different than what U.S. distributors agreements look like. Um, and so, um, yeah, I get it all the time that uh, from filmmakers, you know, a they can't get the distributors to call them back. Um, you know, there are some distributors that are pretty good, have an open door policy of looking at lots of material. And there's some distributors that just want to really use the system of agents and reps that are out there to, to kind of be a um, kind of a buffer against all the content that's out there. They don't need to see 10,000 movies a year. They want to look at the top three or 400 in which to choose the 20 they might distribute that year. So um, it just, yeah, it, most, most filmmakers, um, 
when they go to AFM, AFM is a great learning process, but it's not a great really a t great tool for an independent filmmaker to go to and actually sell their own film. It usually, um, they experience it once, they'll, they'll find it's really hard to get in those doors to meet with distributors. And most distributors and sales agents want to uh, keep, keep the wolves at bay, so to speak. Right, so if a filmmaker says, well, I'm very hands-on and DIY, I'll, I'll, I'll be the one to break through. It's kind of like they're breaking protocol a little bit. That's not how it's yeah, done. Yeah, it's, well, it, it's not that it's not okay. Um, it's just that there are, there are some companies that it's just hard to get a return phone call. They're just busy dealing with the reps and agents for film. And they're, they're getting, some of these companies are getting five, six submissions a day. And some of them, they just completely ignore. They just look at it and think, I don't know what that is. There's just, there's just too much incoming. Um, so it helps to have someone that knows them that says, hey, I can vouch that this is something you should take a look at. It's not crazy for you to look at this. You may not like it. You may love it, but it's something you should you know, pay attention to. Um, you know, that, that's one aspect of it. But it, even more than that, um, there are some doors that it's, they're easy to get into, but you shouldn't go through them, <laughs> right? There's some people that just don't have your best interest at heart. There are just a, there's a lot of, um, in my opinion, companies that just don't do it properly and take exorbitant fees, um, don't cap their costs, don't do things that they should do to, to, to help their, the, their client, the filmmaker, um, you know, maximize revenues for them as well as for the company that took on the film. So, um, um, yeah, so there's, there's multiple reasons to have a rep. Um, I think, you know, beyond just being able to get in the door. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've known, there, there are also people that make film after film after film and establish relationships where they can just do that themselves as well, especially first time, second time filmmakers that have the hardest time, which are most independent filmmakers. Um, at the end of the day, of the of the ten thousand made a year, it's nine thousand plus that are either that are first timers, um, you know, to to a certain degree. So it's not just um, helping you get in the door; it's also maybe helping you uh, stay away from doors that are open that yeah, maybe shouldn't yeah. be venturing into. For sure, and and even if you knew, the, it's also maximizing the best possible situation. Um, even if you get in all the right doors, um, you know. It's helpful to have someone that's had a, a, a deal through this distributor and had a fil film through this streamer and knows what it's like to be in bed with them. To know you know, how good are they at communication? How good are they at returning your phone calls? Um, what do their royalty reports look like? Um, do they send them to you consistently? Because it's not only the contract you have to worry about, it's the behavior behind the contract. Right, because it's fairly easy for distributors to kind of ignore a lot of different aspects of their contract, because it's just the distribution contracts are just hard to sue on. They're all very distributor friendly. Distributors are not going to make overtly producer friendly contracts in general. Um, so even more important than the contract is is the habits and behavior. And you know, have been in the business for twenty five years. I've just seen a lot of. A lot of behavior, <laughs> so to speak. So, um, um, I think that's pretty helpful. Sure, and these are these are contracts that only the distributor draws up. Like someone couldn't say, I, "I've actually have my own boilerplate contract." Yeah, no, they, they, it's always <laughs> the distributor's mine. contract. Okay. In fact, you should be actually wary if it's not their contract because that probably indicates they don't know better, and they haven't been doing it very long. I have seen that before, where I, I got a. Actually, not too long ago, someone came to me with a film, and they already had an offer from someone. And I said, "Okay, um, did they have a? Did they send you a contract I could look at for you?" And they said, "No, they wanted us to sit and do the contract." And I said, "Well, they they can't be that sophisticated if they if they're out there acquiring films and wanting you know you to come up with the contract. That's just pretty pretty. It's a good sign that they're just not very savvy." <laughs> 